I love to travel, and I love to sing. I hope you can bear with me on that one. And I love to swim. So uh, when in Egypt, for example, when I snorkel or dive with the beautiful fishes in the corals, I used to mask sing to see if I can make the fishes hear my song, or at least the vibrations, because we know that plants, they respond positively to nice small talk and beautiful music. So here it is, ready? For to the queen of hearts is the ace of sorrow. And by that phrase, I commit that I am a peptimist. You get that? I grew up in a small village in mid Trøndelag, and I loved the strawberries, the sweet peas, the turnips, and everything that grew in my parents' garden and fields. But I loved the big cities even more. I'll forsake them all and go, and that's what I did. I was, uh, you know, uh, longing for the exotic restaurants, the tall buildings, crowded airports. So, I was actually heading for the future. And I remember my mother, Gida, she said to me when I was a kid, that you are so curious and fast that your head is around the corner of the house before you, the rest of your body follow. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, I am trained and educated in uh, scenarios, foresight and strategy. But frankly, today, to my mind, the future is downloading itself at such an up-speed tempo that we have uh, no other choice but to act. And we better act fast to uh, rethink and recreate solutions for our livelihood and our urban futures. Our brains are organized in belief systems, whether we believe or not believe. We believe what we believe. But our ego, our mind, is also organized from hope to hope. That's how we navigate. And without hope, there isn't much hope, right? <clears throat> I was lucky to meet with this Václav Havel, the intellectual Czechoslovakian, who uh, actually made an impression on the whole generation. And he said uh, that hope is not the same as optimism. Hope is a state of the mind, not a state of the world. So. The history of the future are sometimes ancient. This is from 1987. This is our then Prime Minister, Gru Harlem Brundtland, launching our common future, also called the Brundtland Report, and launching the concept of sustainability. <coughs> and there they stated that we, as mankind, had between 25 and 35 years to avoid a global catastrophe. And you can count, and this was 87. So what now? Does the future have a future? Well, the peptimist in me says that the plausible scenario for our blue planet is, it's all over now, baby blue. But I choose to hope not. The world's population will be close to 10 billion people by 2050. Most of us will be living in urban areas. This means we'll be building urban environments the size of one New York City every month. How can we provide enough fresh and healthy food for all of us? Urban Feed is a clever system combining production of seafood and vegetables, making use of a recirculating aqua system and a smart greenhouse in an integrated unit. A win-win coexistence for both blue and green species. With minimal CO2 emissions, maximum recirculation and low energy costs, the Urban Feed is an optimal system for year-round production of fish and vegetables in closed environments. The integrated food production unit is monitored by a cloud-based sensor and control system. Amongst other things, controlling the bubble-based greenhouse, a surprisingly simple yet very effective temperature regulation system. The urban feed solution can be built and adapted to all climate zones and market preferences. And it is definitely ideal for installation in vertical structures. Urban feed enables sustainable production of food from healthy plants and fish right in your neighborhood. Urban Feed, mixing blue and green, maximizing production and minimizing waste. Yeah, this is our concept when we work to create year-round produ production of fresh fish and greens in a controlled ecological environment, C-E-E. -E. And uh, we work with the Norwegian Center of Expertise in the city of Halden in Norway and uh, they are experts in smart cities and communities. And uh, you know, smart cities is a talk of the town, be it in 
Mustard in Singapore, in Dubai, in Ardendal, I hope, I'm sure. <clears throat> so what comes to our mind when we think of smart cities? Digitalized techno towers, uh, Cyberville, knowledge-based, ubiquitous, you know, cars have no drivers, they're so smart, and uh, the reception has no receptionist. So these uh, digitalized smart city scenarios, they are quite good, I like them, but aren't we missing something vital in this uh, scenario of our smart living urban areas? Uh, we will be 70% living in urban areas in the years to come, or more, from a sustainable part of view, point of view, that is a smart move. We stand for 75% of the energy consumption and 80% of the green gas outlets. It's not very smart. It seems like we are designing urban areas for, and cities for social and ecological catastrophes. How can we feed all these people with fresh food in the years to come? That's our question. And um, we simply cannot eat apps, can we? So our suggestion is uh, grow your city. And city farming, urban farming, rooftop gardening is also a sign of the times, and the times truly are changing. You got that? Yeah. <laughs> when I was young, I loved to sing Suzanne, the Leonard Cohen song. And she shows you where to look among the garbage and the flowers. And that's exactly the perspective we find intriguing in our project. Actually, we don't say garbage anymore. Because that's not right. It's, it's, it's uh, rest raw material. Or it's biomass in this circular economy. And, uh, you know, plants like fish poo and the uh, CO2 that the fish produce. And fish like rest raw materials from the plants. And they live happy together. That's how we foresee this and they are happy, healthy, well-fed, well-fit, as we say. This is one illustration, possible, rendered to show how a, such a large-scale food production unit might look like in urban, urban neighborhoods. Down at the below, you see there can be fish, and then there's human habitat, and then three layers on green growth. And in such a unit, we estimate we can grow like 450 tons of fish annually, and in the green, between 1,000 and 1,500 tons. That's a mouthful. This can also be useful in refugee camps. We know that um, 50 million, as I speak on this planet, are displaced internally in their own country or refugees abroad. We also know that one-sixth of our population, that is one billion, uh, suffers from chronic hunger and 3.5 million children that die from undernutrition every year. So here's our su suggestion. Make food, not war. <laughs> and I might add also, make more love and less babies. But you know, you can't say that. <laughs> <coughs> well, uh, we have three strategic partners in our project. One is delivering a transparent architecture that you saw in the video. It's a Canadian, and the envelope consists of two layers of a very light, very strong woven material that is, uh, you know, uh, fixed to aluminium profiles. And in between there is the cavity that is dynamically filled with bubbles and emptied with bubbles according to the inner climate. And this aquaculture partner we have, they are specialists in one of the five best on this planet on RAS systems, which means recirculating aqua systems. So you, you don't need to be close to water, you can grow the fish in Madrid or in the middle of a desert with this system. And that's again integrated with the vertical green growth. It could be aquaponics, hydroponics. The third partner delivers a control and monitoring system, smart sensors, monitoring humidity, CO2, temperature, and other vital parameters needed to secure optimal growth conditions. Big data is transforming food safety big time. And the fact about facts is that there are too many of them, and we need people to interpret all these facts. Because this data I was talking about goes to the cloud, and then we get a lot of information that, uh, again, could be interpreted. And after a while, these systems get self-learning, so actually this knowledge can be shared among other growers. So we have to turn and face the change. Ch -ch changes. Who said that? Changes. Oh, civilized. Thank you. Very good. We navigated the five T's in our project. 
Do you get it? Talent, timing, trust, transparency, and again, this tempo that I think is urgent. The food production unit should be, as I see it in some kind, in every neighborhood, actually. There you can have um, school children having biology classes, learning about life science, creating their own food. You can have professional growers, you can have uh, people on rehab to learn about the birds and the bees and the flowers and the trees and the fish underneath, as you can see. Again, blue. <coughs> and uh, this is Snöhetta's illustration of Norwegian Architect Company. And you see the double layer of plastic with greens on the top. Um, when we look into our local futures, I think we need to think that we are both local and global communities, and we need global solutions for smart urban communities. Also, this island economy that we talk about, where we are, have self-supply, self-sufficiency locally. Food security from a gender lens is also essential in this context. You know that women do a lot about growing food, feeding people. And I was actually the first uh, editor-in-chief and founder of the Radio Urakel, Radio Oracle, uh, a women's radio, first in the world in the 80s, early 80s. It's still on the air and also in a couple of African countries. And you know, in, er, in um, agriculture, there is a very clear tendency towards feminization these days. And I really do hope that um, a oh, girl, girl, that girls and women, remember that, should embrace this smart, urban, large-scale food production, in addition to rooftop gardens and small parcels. This is a picture, you might think that's from early 80s too, but that's actually taken four weeks ago. And you can see, there is a slight imbalance here, and to my right is the Norwegian Minister of Fisheries, and there's a beautiful bunch of grown-up men, you know, and we love that, but you know, something's missing here. Um, you know, uh, how many edible plants do you think there is on this planet, estimated? 90,000. The food we eat, 90% of that comes from 30 plants. Why, why aren't we more creative? Why don't we grow exotic fish and exotic plants also on our, our soil, in our urban food production units? To my mind, fish and plants makes a happy marriage. But to my mind, fish are from Mars, and plants are from Venus. <laughs> and you can have a look. <laughs> <laughs> and there are lots of proof on this. Just ask me and I'll provide it. <laughs> the brain runs on fun. Or actually, it's the neurotransmitter dopamine that's at work that also enhances learning. So. To my funny brain, I think we should make great playgrounds to create other ways and to rethink the way we do things. And also in these closed environments, build this at a minimum space because we can build upwards, you know? And the one I showed you earlier, the first one is 60 by 80. So you can grow a lot on minimum space with minimum CO2, actually close to zero CO2 emissions, lower energy costs, and maximum recycling and maximum produce. I mentioned these two kinds of cloud-based systems we're using. The clouds in the cavity of the building envelope, that is actually a biomimic kind of cloud. You know what happens when the cloud comes in front of the sun. It gets cooler, right? And the other, this is this cloud-based system that is smart and gives us the information on the growth conditions. But I really don't know clouds at all. But I do know that these two types of cloud-based systems do the work in our context. So plants stretch for sun, that's a fact. We too sometimes. So we let the sun shine in, but only to the degree that is needed for the photosynthesis. The rest, like the heat, is kept out. Börge, in our aquaculture partner, he, the CEO, he is a biologist, comes from the same area in Norway as, as I do. He is an expert in cod, which is a Nordic fish, and baramundi, which is a tropic fish. That needs like 16 degrees and 29 degrees. And in my youth, I sang in a band called, uh, I, I don't, 
want to say the name of the band, but we copied the song of the lady band Heart. Do you remember that? I've got the music in me. I heat up, I cool down. That's exactly what we do. We heat up, we cool down, and you know the fish tanks then carrying the water. They, that might also serve as a thermal mass that interlinks with the other cloud-based climate and energy controlling system. <clears throat> so, when we have had our fish loins and our fresh greens untraveled in our neighborhood with hanging gardens and enjoy life in cities, um, what else can we make use of? Plants eat fish poo, fish eat plant waste, but there are other ingredients here that can be made use of, like um, calcium for nutrition additives, like if liver and roe for skin products for young, pretty men. Uh, you know, it's um, enzymes for medical products. I'm sure we will uh, exploit and develop a lot of products based on the blue and green bioeconomy in the years to come in this circular way of looking upon the ec economy. And we also suggest keep it simple, smart, safe, sustainable. And it's irresistible to say, well, I wasn't told when the boy kiss a girl, you know what that is. You take a trip around the world, hey, hey. And then we see smart bio-based economy. And that's not only about producing delicious fresh food. It is also about handbags. <laughs> this handbag is made from salmon skin from a Norwegian designer who explores eco-design. And you know, a woman without a handbag is like a fish without water. So, one more confession before I wrap up. That is, that before Brexit times, you know how a megacity of London can change the whole agenda of Europe? I was declaring myself as a free and independent republic by the name of Rita, and I am a devolutionary republic. And, you know, I urge you, grow your smart cities, stay tuned, act fast, and act naturally. Dong, 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 diddly, do, da, bum, diddly, do, da, bum, bum, diddly, do. Thank you. <laughs>